Look. Those. Better yet, beat the hell out of him at the ballot box. Beat the hell out of him at the ballot box. Left and right, Japan has influenced... Today I bring to you a groundbreaking discovery that has shaken the very foundations of our understanding of intelligence. Move over Einstein, there's a new genius in town, and it comes in the form of Panda poop. Yes, you heard that correctly. Panda poop. The excrement of the giant panda, Iluripada melanoleuca, has been scientifically proven to exhibit higher levels of intelligence than, wait for it, James Comer and Nancy Mace our markets as well. This is not someone that I don't think the American people can trust as we get closer to, to the election. As First, let's talk about composition. Panda poop is a marvel of efficiency. Every bamboo shoot that enters a panda's mouth is carefully processed, broken down, and transformed into a perfect, fibrous cylinder. This level of precision is something our political figures can only dream of. I mean, she denies being put in charge of the border, but Biden made it clear he asked her to lead the effort. So did she decline his invitation or just simply fail at the task? She looked to me in the video to be pretty satisfied that he finally put her in charge of something. In fact, Trey, that's the only thing that I can remember that President Biden ever put her in charge the of. Friendly. It's a natural fertilizer, enriching the soil fostering new plant growth, and contributing to the circle of life. In contrast, the output from certain political figures tends to leave the environment, both ecological and social, in a state of disarray. During the whole uh, first term of the, the Biden-Harris administration, so she failed miserably at the border. Uh, if she was in charge of trying to subdue uh, uh, border crossings... ...makers could be as straightforward as a panda's digestive tract. And let's not forget problem solving. Pandas, though often perceived as clumsy, have mastered the art of survival. They've adapted to live on a diet of bamboo, a task so challenging it requires eating for up to 14 hours a day. Meanwhile, some politicians struggle to adapt to the most basic challenges of governance, like passing a budget or agreeing on what day it is. And one thing that we're trying to find out on the Oversight Committee is the cost of this. You know, this, this has had a huge impact on Medicaid because many of these people, when they cross the border, they get free health care. That's what Medicaid is, is free health care. They get transported all over the United States. We've had mayors and local officials in, in many states that have contacted us and said at the at two or three in the morning, a plane lands and unloads all these illegals into their community. That costs money. It costs money on the public school systems for these kids to be stuck in public schools that are already behind when they get here. So we want to know the cost and we want to know exactly what Kamala Harris did other than basically send an open invitation to the world to illegally cross our border. And the reason you I, I want to shift gears a little bit on this one, because it, it really it, what has struck me since Donald Trump's um, press conference is sort of the, the sort of highbrow nature of the press uh, coming at Kamala Harris saying, well, she, in my view, whining that she hasn't she, she doesn't talk to us. She hasn't done a, um, a sit down with us. She hasn't done interviews with us. Uh, and I watched that press conference and I go, well, when you start actually asking real questions of Donald Trump and pressing him, then that sort of creates a space of balance. But then, but then I look at polling. You have the New York Times Siena poll showing Harris versus Trump in battleground states. Michigan, she's up by four, 50-46. Pennsylvania, up by four, 50-46. And in Wisconsin, up by four, 50-46. All of that's within the margin of error. So at one point you say strategically, why do I need to talk to you right now? I'm talking to the American people and we're having a conversation. You're happy to follow it and to report on it. How, does, how do you think the campaign balances going forward? You know she's going to sit down at some point. But right now, is there a real need for her to sort of, you know, get the imprimatur of the press on her campaign and her, and her efforts when she's having a very good conversation seemingly with the American people without them? Right. Well, we have to remember Kamala Harris has only been at the top of the ticket for roughly three weeks. I mean, it, I know it's felt like, yes. you know, months like and time. months. It's <laughs> barely been three weeks. Uh, Governor Walsh was added to the ticket less than a week ago. So they're, they're 
perfecting their origin stories, as Basil just talked about. They're reintroducing, she's reintroducing herself to the American public now as the, possibly the leader of the free world. She's introducing her runnermate for the first time. You know, most Minnesotans know who he is, but no one else, you know, besides last week, really had thoughts on Governor Walz. So this time, and you know, when they go into the DNC, there'll be the era of good feelings and obviously lots of celebrities and, you know, it, it'll be a great show. There will be a dip, obviously, and so it's incumbent upon the press to not harp on the fact that the dip is going to occur, most likely, just because that's how things happen. She will sit down with them, but I think ever since COVID, time has been a construct. So, you know, we're talking about Kamala Harris as though she's been running for this office for the past year and a half. It has not even been a month. And so as she perfects, you know, her messaging on the stump, as she introduces and reintroduces herself and her ticket to the American people, then she'll have more specific policy issues. But I think it's also incumbent upon the press to, to be honest about the fact that they treat these two candidates differently. You know, mm -hmm. Donald Trump is allowed to ramble, 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 lie, 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 and everyone just says, well, you know, it's so hard to keep up with them and all the lies. We try, but what are you gonna do, right? Whereas Kamala Harris is held to a different standard. So knowing that, and Democrats know that, right? When we sort of make jokes about Republicans, oh, they clutch their pearls, how dare we, we're so mean. You know, now all of a sudden they're, you're crying crocodile tears. When we've seen the gutter language that Republicans use about Democrats and the American people. So knowing that it's not a level, uh, a level playing field, Kamala Harris as a black woman, as an Indian woman, as you know, the child of two immigrants, she knows that America has never been a, a level playing field, yet she plays the game very well. And I think this rollout has been almost seamless. And if they stick to the game plan, which is explaining to the American people what they have done as a Democratic Party and what they plan to do as far as economic issues that matter to American families, I think that they'll be in, in good footing. Here is a challenge to you, and I mean a real challenge. Can you describe the former loser guy uh, with all his felons, the convicted rapist, the criminal, uh, one Donald J. Trump? Can you describe him in one word? Now, I'm being serious. You've got one word. It can be any word you like. Is there one word that instantly, in your mind, sums him up? Uh, for me, well, just off the top of my head, uh, I was thinking delusional, just based on what J.D. Vads had to say. <laughs> Dear, you know what? Come back SNL, like, quick. I mean, J.D. Vads and SNL are made for each other. The open monologue, the opening monologue is just perfect. Uh, and please, can we have this debate when it happens between uh, Tim Moores and... Uh, that is going to be, never mind box office, he's going to be like, uh, whitewash. He's, he's going to just wash, wipe the flood. We may have to call 911. Here, I know the people of Nevada, you are battle born. <laughs> you are battle born. And if Donald Trump wants to pick a fight, over our most fundamental freedoms, we say, bring it on. Bring it on. Bring it on. agree with them or make the same choice, but we know that this nation, things work best when you mind your own damn business. You mind your own damn business. I don't, I don't need any help. I don't need any help from those guys telling me which books to read. I sure the heck don't need any lecture about morality from those guys. And the last thing they can mind their own damn business is, I don't need any help from them talking about my family. And this is where it gets personal, where they want to dictate things like IVF and reproductive care. I know there's a lot of you out there, this is the most personal choices we have. When my wife and I decided to have children, we spent years going through fertility treatments. And I said, I remember, we have somebody to help. You have water? All right, thanks for helping your neighbors. But I, you're helping, you're good? All right, thank you. 
So, I remember those waiting for the phone calls. You'd go through the treatments. I would have my neighbor come over to have to give shots to my wife and things like that. Um, and the phone would ring, and you would just hope so highly that it would be good news. And then when you found out the treatments didn't work, it was a darkness that could blot out the sun. So I have to tell you, it wasn't by chance when that phone call finally came, and we found out we were going to welcome our daughter into the world. We, we named her the most powerful word in the universe, hope, hope. So when you, hear, when you hear Kamala Harris and I talk about freedom, we're very clear about this. We mean the freedom to make your own health care decisions. And that your children should be free to go to school without worrying about being shot dead in their classroom. We've got a brand new poll out this morning by the New York Times and Siena College showing among likely voters, Harris is leading 50% to 46% in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Now, viewers of the show know I am not a big fan of polls, but when I see a distinct and consistent trend, Congressman, I will call it out. I want to get your thoughts on this huge widening, I think, margin, although we're still within the margin of error, but still this big widening margin between what the numbers were previously when it was a Joe Biden, Donald Trump matchup. I mean, look, I, I love what's happening out of the, the recent polling, and there's two things that are really important. I mean, one, in poll after poll, including what came out today from The New York Times, um, you're seeing her margin get better and increase and actually create some space, especially in the swing states. That's crystal clear. Um, every single poll is coming out showing a positive improvement uh, for the vice president and for Democrats. The second part about this, which I think is also really important, is we know that there is one person in the country that is the most obsessed with polling, and his name is Donald Trump. And so you know that he is going absolutely bonkers. This is driving him absolutely crazy that she is actually now beating him in some of these swing states. Uh, I, I, you know, there's a lot of reports about how he's uh, taking the news. Not well. Um, and I think what it shows most importantly is that Kamala Harris is resonating with the American public, especially in the swing states. Tim Walls is resonating with the American public. What a fantastic vice presidential pick. And so I think you're going to continue to see a strengthening of the Harris-Walls tickets in polling as we move forward, but do not be complacent. I tell folks all the time, polling is a snapshot in time. We've got to fight every single day, because like she says, when we fight, we win. But then also, we have a real fight at the top of the ticket that is worth fighting for. And no one can tell me that Donald Trump is somehow the same as, as the Democratic ticket in any way, shape, or form. Try telling that to a trans kid in Tennessee that, that whose president is going gonna, is gonna to be the same. I'll tell you it's going to be really, really different. And we have an obligation to stand in solidarity. Tell that to a woman who's bleeding out in an ER in, in, in potentially Missouri or in another, in another state that doesn't guarantee the same abortion rights and the same rights to reproductive justice and care uh, that they do in other states. This isn't a game. It's not a game. And this is, in many ways, and for many people, an election of life and death. And that's not hyperbole.